And good morning. The uh, scripture this morning is from Daniel, chapter 9, verses 15 to 19 from the NIV. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem your city, your holy hill. Our sins and our iniquities, our ancestors, have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, And here, open our eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Good morning. All right, as uh, many of you know by now, every now and again, I like to reference uh, my psychology degree. That was my undergraduate. Uh, And uh, that's what I'm going to do this morning to start. So anyways, let's say you're driving down the highway and you see a car on the side of the road with a flat tire. Uh, And the person there is struggling to change the tire, and then they start waving you down, and it's just, it's clear that they don't know how to change a tire. And let's say that you actually do know how to change a tire. If you don't, I recommend that you learn because it's a good uh, life skill to know. But let's say you know how to change a tire, and you see this person struggling and waving you down. Do you actually stop to help? a bit of silence. Well, most studies will actually say that, no, you'll likely keep on going. The majority of people do that. But some other studies show that men are more likely to stop if that one person who is asking for help is a young, attractive woman. (laughs) It's true. Men are more likely to stop and help if the person needing help is young and attractive female. Uh, In fact, they're more likely to stop even if that woman is not in need of help. She's not waving you down. She's changing the tire on her own, perfectly capable, and she's not asking for help. It's still more likely that men are going to stop. Now, I don't know what studies say in regards to uh, what gets a woman to pull over uh, to help. My apologies for not having all the information. But this particular study that I'm referencing was done around the topic of altruism. Uh, Altruism, simply put, is the idea of doing something for others uh, with absolutely no benefit to yourself. Uh, It's helping others strictly for their sake and not out of some selfish benefit. And so this particular study was looking at how altruistic the general population is. And that is, what percentage of people would stop and go out of their way to help change a tire with absolutely no perceived benefit? Now, the finding that men are more likely to stop if it is a young, attractive woman asking for help suggests that even an act of perceived altruism isn't actually that altruistic. It suggests that men are actually thinking selfishly, as though there may be something in it for them. Fat chance, right? Uh, Now, there are many studies that actually show this across all populations, that people are not altruistic because they almost always have ulterior motives. There's something else that's driving them to help others, even if it is simply doing something nice just to get a little pick-me-up within you or that feel-good feeling. Now, in general, people are not altruistic. In fact, some psychologists would go as far as to say that it is impossible to be completely altruistic. There is always some sort of personal benefit, and so it is impossible to do something for others strictly for their sake. Now, if you pause to think about it, 
This idea can be particularly true in Christian circles when it comes to our prayer. At least I found this is the case with me. So often I come to God in prayer with my requests and the various things that I want from God. Prayer almost seems to be about what we can get from God. We want God's blessings, and so we ask for things like strength, for health, for wisdom, for more faith, more hope, more love, more, more, and more. Now, don't get me wrong, these are great things to pray for, uh, both for yourself and for others. And we see in scriptures examples of these sorts of prayer. But when we focus on only these blessings, we begin to distort the gospel into the prosperity gospel, uh, where we're only in it for what we can get from God. But what happens when we don't receive these things in the way we expect? Earlier this morning, we sang the song, Blessed Be Your Name, uh, in, in which we hear the refrain, you give and you take away. But what is our image of God when God seems to be taking things away rather than giving us our wants and desires? Now, thinking of Job, we see a man who had all these blessings, and yet he also lost all of these things. But he was still able to have faith in God. And for us, when we focus only on what God can give us, it's very hard to have faith when we don't receive or when we lose all those blessings. And so I think it is important to learn how to pray in a different way. Particularly, I think it is crucial to learn how to pray for God's sake and not for our, our own sake. And this is where Daniel comes in. So yes, after all that ramble, this is still a part of the series on Daniel. Uh, today we are looking at chapter 9. Now, chapter 9 contains a prayer by Daniel where he prays not for his own sake, but for God's sake. Daniel prays that God would act, and again, not for his own personal benefit, but for God's benefit. And so there is a lot in this prayer that we can learn from, uh, and it is a good starting point for learning how to pray for God's sake. But before we get into the lessons on this chapter uh, and what it has around prayer, it would be good to first take a look at this chapter as a whole for what it all contains. So just as a quick note, much of the material uh, for this morning was inspired by the work of Alcock in his book, Fearless. And this is the same book that Russ has been working through uh, for, uh, for this series in Daniel. So then looking at chapter 9 of Daniel, uh, we can see that it is broken down into three parts. There's an introduction, there's the actual prayer by Daniel, and then there's a response by God through the angel Gabriel. In the introduction, we see what actually led Daniel to pray. And what we see is that Daniel was studying the words of Jeremiah, the prophet, and through those words of Jeremiah, Daniel came to understand that this exile that, uh, that Israel was currently in was to last for only 70 years. Now, 70 years was approximately the time that Israel was in exile, but that doesn't mean we should understand 70 as an exact number. It's not as though Daniel calculated the exact amount of time, and that's what led him to prayer. Rather, 70 years should be understood as about a single lifetime. Now, Daniel had been in Babylon for the entirety of the exile thus far. He's lived through numerous kings and numerous conflicts, and it is likely that he felt he was nearing the end of his life. And then, in his studies of Jeremiah, he reads that Israel's exile would last for a lifetime. And for Daniel, it has been a lifetime. And he sees that God was at work. He sees that the exile has been a lifetime, and through that, he is led to pray. And so again, what led Daniel to pray was not, uh, not that he had calculated the time and found that it was 70 years, but what, le but what led Daniel to pray was that he was immersed in Scripture, and through that, he had a glimpse of how God was at work. And through reading the Scriptures, Daniel knew that God was in control and that God had a plan. And so Daniel was led to join in with God's plans through prayer. 
And then following this introduction, we see the prayer that Daniel prayed. Now, throughout the book of Daniel, we hear time and time again about how Daniel is a person of prayer. He is constantly praying, but we rarely know what he is actually praying. And so here in chapter 9, we actually get a glimpse of what he prays. Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 contains three main components. First off, there is a component of confession, where Daniel repents of his sin and of the sins of Israel. There is also a component of worshiping God, where Daniel recognizes the various characteristics of God. And it is these two components of confession and worship that actually take up the majority of the prayer. And then nearing the end of the prayer, while still confessing and worshiping God, Daniel finally makes requests of God. And this is the third component of the prayer, requests and petitions. And what's really interesting here is that Daniel does not make these requests for his own sake, or even for the sake of Israel, but he makes these requests for the sake of God. He makes these requests that God's name would be known. Now, if anyone has any reason and standing to make requests of God for their own personal sake, it would be Daniel. Daniel has lived in exile for pretty well his whole life. And again, he lived through many kings. Uh, He was hated by all the other advisors. He was thrown into a lion's den. And this whole time, he did not stray from God. Surely he could ask God to do something for his own personal sake just this once. But no, he does not ask God to bless him or to give him fortune. He doesn't even ask God to see the promised land of Israel once again. Rather, Daniel asks God to act for God's sake, that God would be known amongst the nations and amongst Israel. So that's Daniel's prayer, which is the second part of chapter 9. And then the third part of Daniel 9 uh, is God's response. God responds to Daniel through the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel gave Daniel a rather obscure vision that's often referred to as the 77s. Now remember, these 77s are not a specific period of time. It's not to be known as 490 years exactly. Uh, But rather, the number 7 is the number of perfection in Jewish culture. So seven years is a perfect period of time which God has set aside and to which God knows the end. Seventy sevens, then, is essentially a lifetime worth of these perfect periods. Or to put it in today's term, uh, it's a significantly extended period of time through which God is at work and to which God knows the end. And in this significant period of time, Gabriel gives Daniel a vision about the temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem, about the coming of the Anointed One, about a new covenant being made, and about the temple in Jerusalem eventually being destroyed. Now, to some degree, this sounds like great news, but at the same time, it's not likely what the nation of Israel would have wanted to hear. Yes, they wanted the temple to be rebuilt, and they wanted the Anointed One to come, the King, Uh, and they wanted uh, to be united by that king. But why was it such a long time away? Why did they have to wait so long? This was good news, but it was not for them to experience. It was for the distant generations. And so it was also hard news to bear. And furthermore, at the end of it all, the temple would be destroyed. Surely that's not good news for the nation of Israel, right? Fortunately, we can look back on this and see how this was great news. We know that the anointed one was Jesus, and that through Jesus, we don't need the physical building of the temple, and we don't need the sacrificial system anymore. But still, I don't think this was the news Israel would have been looking for in the moment. And this shows us that while God did respond to Daniel, God did not respond in the way that Israel likely would have expected or even wanted God to respond. God had plans for the world, but God's plans were not the hopes and plans of Israel. So that is chapter 9 in a very brief nutshell. And so now I want to look at what this teaches us about praying for God's sake. What does it teach us about praying with God as the focus and not 
ourselves. Now, I've briefly touched on some of the points, but there are four things that I want to go over. Four things that we need to recognize when we pray for God's sake. I'll quickly list them, and then we'll take a closer look at each of them. So when we pray for God's sake, it begins by recognizing how God is at work. And from there, we recognize God's character, and we recognize our sin. And finally, when we pray for God's sake, we recognize God's plan. And so let's look at each of these four a little bit closer. And to start, when we pray for God's sake, we recognize that God is at work. And to do this, it is good to be immersed in Scripture, just like Daniel was. Daniel was reading from Jeremiah, and in doing so, he recognized God's plans. He saw how God was working through the nation of Israel, and how, in spite of the exile, God was still in control. And this led Daniel to pray. For us to see how God is at work, it is good to look back at our history, both in Scripture but also our more recent history. Many of us can look back and see how God has been at work in our own lives or the lives of our relatives. And then through this reflection on how God has been at work in the world, we should be led to pray. And it is also in this reflection on Scripture and on our history that we can recognize the next steps to praying for God's sake. So, when we recognize how God is at work, we then begin to recognize the character of God. When we reflect on how God has already been at work in the world, we start to understand God's character a little bit better. And we can then respond in worshiping God. And this is exactly what Daniel does in his prayer. So listen to some of these characteristics of God that Daniel names. God is great and awesome. God keeps a covenant of love. God is righteous and God is merciful and forgiving. Daniel knew that these characteristics of God were true because he saw how God worked within history, both within the history of Israel and even within his own history, his own story. And so when we are immersed in the Bible and when we reflect on how God has been at work throughout the history of the world, we begin to see the characteristics of God, and in that we can respond in giving God worship. But when we recognize how God has been at work in this world, we not only recognize God's character, but we also recognize our sin. We begin to see how all of humanity has fallen short, how we have all turned away from God. And this recognition of our sin should lead us to confession. We see Daniel doing this throughout his prayer and in and amongst his worship of God. Daniel is continually confessing. He recognizes how Israel has turned away from God and how they have been a wicked people. And Daniel repents of this. Now what I find particularly interesting in that is that Daniel doesn't just confess his own sins. Rather, he confesses the sins for all of Israel. And not just Israel currently, but he is confessing the sins of the past Israel. And what is particular, particularly interesting about this is that Daniel is not doing this as a way of distancing himself from the rest of Israel. He's not confessing in a way that throws the rest of Israel under the bus, so to speak. But rather, Daniel is identifying directly with them. He is including himself as a part of that history. He is saying that he is a part of that disobedient group. That he is a part of the rebellion a part of the wickedness, and a part of the unfaithful of Israel. And this is really interesting because if we look at the book of Daniel, we actually see that that's not really true. Daniel has been faithful to God. Daniel has not rebelled. He has followed God and kept God's commands. And so if anyone, again, has any reason to distance himself from the Israel of the past, it would be Daniel. Thus, you might think that it would make more sense for Daniel to pray something along the lines of this. God, my people of the past have sinned and were unfaithful. But look at me now. I've changed. I follow you and keep your commands. I'm different than the past. Surely you can be merciful to me now. 
Surely you can pour out your blessings upon me. But this is not at all what Daniel prays. And I think it is, it is because he has recognized something important about sin. And that is sin is not just an individual's problem, but rather it is a problem for all of humanity. So often when we enter into a time of confession, we focus only on our sins. We think about only what I personally have done wrong. And if we can't think of anything more, uh, then we think, well, we're all good. And we just have to wait for God's blessing. But Daniel recognized that sin is more than just an individual's problem. He recognizes that it is a problem of humanity. And therefore, it is your sin because you are a part of humanity. You cannot separate yourself entirely from sin because you cannot separate yourself from humanity. Now this idea of being a part of a sin that's larger than your own individual sin is often what is referred to as corporate sin. Corporate sin is sin that you are a part of just by being human. It's sin that in some sense is unavoidable because there are other powers at work in this world. For example, for us today, it is more than likely that most of us have some articles of clothing that were manufactured in a sweatshop. So a manufacturer that employs children uh, and doesn't even come close to paying uh, a living wage. Or if you have visited and marveled at the wonders of the great pyramids in Egypt, the Mayan ruins in Mexico, or even present-day Dubai, then you, are, then you are marveling over structures that were built on the backs of slaves. Or, if you live here in Winnipeg, or really anywhere in Canada, and you do not have indigenous heritage, then you have benefited off of colonialism, broken treaties, racism, and oppression. And even if you attend church here at Westwood, then you are identifying with a group that has a history of being passive-aggressive, and divisive. Now for most of these, it's easy to try and distance ourselves from them. We say, well sure, our church was divisive, but we've changed. Or it was my ancestors who oppressed the indigenous people and broke the treaties, but I had nothing to do with that. Or sure, the pyramids were built by slaves, but that was thousands of years ago. Can't I just enjoy them now? We always try and distance ourselves from sin, and especially corporate sin. But in doing so, we more or less throw the other under the bus. We say, well, that may be happening, but I have nothing to do with that. But Daniel actually shows us the exact opposite. Daniel recognizes the sin of humanity, and he identifies directly with them. And he, uh, even though he really had nothing to do with it, he did he identifies with them. Daniel sees the powers at work in the world, and he confesses the corporate sins of humanity because he recognizes his own humanity. Now, it's hard to recognize and identify with corporate sin, partly because we feel like we had nothing to do with it, but also because it often seems like there is really nothing we can do about it. I've heard people talk about corporate sin in a way where they are left feeling hopeless. There's nothing that we can do about it, so why even bother? It's too big to do anything about. But it is only in recognizing corporate sin and confessing them that we can then move into recognizing God's plan for the world. And it is that that gives us hope. So when we recognize corporate sin, what we are doing is we are recognizing that things are not right in this world. And at the same time, we can then recognize that God has a better plan for this world. And when we recognize that God has a better plan for this world and a better plan that we can, than we can ever imagine, that's when we can start to make pleas and requests of God. And it's not because we personally want to benefit, but because we want to see God reign. Uh, and we want to see all of humanity restored to God and freed from this bondage of corporate sin. And this is the hope that we have in God. 
And so this is what we actually see with Daniel. He recognizes that God works in the world. He recognizes the good character of God. He recognizes the sinfulness of humanity. And then through all of that, he recognizes God's greater plan for the world. He sees the hope, and it is this that leads him into making requests of God. Not requests for his own sake, but again, for God's sake. Daniel essentially prays that God's will be done, that God's kingdom would be established, and that God would reign on earth. Now when God answers through Gabriel, God shows Daniel a piece of his plan, and as mentioned earlier, this plan is likely not what people would have wanted or even expected. It's a different plan than if, hu- it, than if humanity were to be in charge. And this is important to remember when we are praying for God's sake. Uh, or for God's will to be done. It's important because it shows us that God's plans are not always the same as ours, but it also shows that God's plans are greater and that they are worth following. Now, I want to end by making this really, really practical for us as a church. This past season, we have been doing a lot of discernment. Uh, Discernment uh, for what God is calling us to focus on for a season, discernment for Pastor Russ uh, and his next steps, and now discernment for a new pastor. Discernment, in essence, is praying for God's sake. It is asking that God's will be done. And this afternoon, we have a prayer and discernment meeting for putting together a pastoral search committee. And it is easy to come into these meetings with a personal agenda. And you say, this is what I want in the next pastor, or this is what we, but really I, Uh, need as a church. But when we do this, it is easy to become combative with one another, and it is even easier to miss what God is calling us into. And so if you are planning on coming out this afternoon, which I recommend that you do, I want to encourage you to follow this example of Daniel's prayer. Beforehand, take some time to reflect on how God has been at work through us as a church. And in that, spend some time in worship for how God has been at work through us and recognize God's character. But then also recognize how we have fallen short. Where have we sinned as a church? And don't do this as a way of throwing throwing others under the bus, uh, but recognize that you are a part of that as well. And then take some time for confession and repentance. And then lastly, as you come to the meeting, I hope that you will recognize God's plan for us as a church. And so it is my prayer that you collectively will receive a vision or a picture of God's plan for our church moving forward. I'm going to call up the worship team uh, now, and as they come up, I'm just going to close in prayer. So let's pray. Lord God, uh, we thank you that you are at work in this world, uh, in this greater world, uh, and in, this, in us as a church. Uh, Lord God, you are, you are so good. You are righteous, you are merciful, you are forgiving. Uh, you love us, and uh, just, it's unimaginable some days how much, uh, how, how good you are to us. And yet, uh, we still fall short, God. Uh, we are sinful. Uh, as a church, as individuals. And so we just ask that uh, you speak to us, you purify us, uh, and uh, you forgive us of our sins because uh, we, are, we are human, God. And so we, we have sinned, we will continue to sin, but we just ask that you continue to work through our lives and purify us. And uh, again, this afternoon as we discern, we just ask that you will give us a picture. Uh, Give us a picture of what you want for us as a church. We pray these things in your name. Amen.